Yannick, I am so thrilled to finally be able to have you on. Thank you so much for spending some time and coming on with me. Of course, Daniel. My pleasure. So where I wanted to start, and this is a profile of you, is if you could just share a quick sketch of your background um, in that, you know, super challenging way I'm going to frame this question is the 60 second version of your story, if you can try and tell that. So built my first website when I was 13, back when Adobe Flash was still cool. So I've been, been a tech nerd ever since, but I actually found my way into very early fintech, like 10 years before fintech was even really a word. Uh, one of the sort of like first uh, online trading companies back in Europe called Saxo Bank started there when I was 17. So like very, very young, which also means I'm one of these little odd characters who's actually not that old, but have been in the space uh, for decades, actually. And um, after that, uh, started another company, which was in London ultimately um, built a lot of interesting things there. We sort of started it back in 08. So it had a very turbulent start to it, but a good ending. And then moved to New York around six years ago, um, right immediately after the Brexit vote, actually. And, uh, and, and started public, which I'm still running as co-CEO, overseeing uh, product design and engineering for the most part. And yeah, you just touched on it there. You know, you're the co-founder and co-CEO of Public. Um, I wanted to ask how you describe what you're building, which I know is always a challenging question. And what will be different about the world if you're wildly successful? And in this case, I think Public is is, is very successful today, but I'm sure in many ways you feel like you're just getting started. Yeah, so we're building the investing platform where you can invest in everything. And uh, to the back half of your question, which uh, a very interesting framing, by the way, I think we are moving. We're moving from a world where what used to be considered the public markets, I guess, historically were mainly the equities markets, right? And then, you know, later maybe some fixed income markets, um, which sort of have been forgotten about for the last 13 year in a low interest rate environment, and now they're kind of coming roaring back. We can touch more on that. But really, we see it as public to expand the definition of what constitutes a public market. Our mission statement, quite literally, is to make the public markets work for all people. And so we, we see it as being up to us to like push the envelope in terms of how you might define a public market, right? I think uh, this day and age, a lot of people would certainly argue that crypto is considered a, a public market and, and, and really continuing to double click on that definition is important to us. And so for that reason, today on public, you can invest um, in stocks and ETFs fractionally. We offer crypto. We offer fractional alternative investments, such as art and collectibles. And just yesterday, actually, we announced that we're going to be offering treasuries as well um, in the form of uh, starting in the in the form of T-bills, uh, which, like I said, is uh, having having somewhat of a comeback in the uh, in this kind of macro environment. And doing that for all people means doing it for all the people in US and Europe and beyond, right? We see a world where there's going to be, call it 250, 300, maybe 400 million people in the US and Europe that have an investing app on their home screen and are able to very easily you know, engage and, and access these markets, but also doing it in a way where you know, that doesn't just become like a, transactional thing for them but that there is a sense of community that we constantly give them context to help them actually be the best investors that they can possibly be um, and so everything that we do at public really goes through that lens and through that filter and that largely um, is how we um, inform our roadmap. You know, you touched on it at the beginning, but you're clearly a serial founder. You know, you've been the co-founder on the founding team of CRH Group, Tradable. Maybe I'm getting that right. Maybe it's tradable. <laughs> now, and now public.com. Um, what are the biggest lessons you've learned at now as you've been a founder multiple times? You know, I've interviewed multiple founders on the podcast. I always feel like there's something different that, they, that they've learned by kind of doing this multiple times. And, and maybe just a secondary question would be, what's, what do you think's changed the most about your approach or philosophy? over time being a founder multiple times. So that's interesting because I actually have found myself recently also just thinking back to a lot of the, so let me take a step back. As a designer, I think a lot about like, you know, the hypotheses that I had and, and spend a lot of time kind of validating those, right? And 
the sort of trading uh, version is a little bit before you place a trade, you should have a good idea of your take profit, right? Like where would you double down or your stop loss? You know, when do you, when do you kill it and move on to something else? Um, and anything that happens in between that, that's the work, right? That you need to kind of figure out. And I've always had a lot of these frameworks early on that I think I just naturally wanted to like disprove in an effort to learn. And so I always actually found myself in the early days always assuming that I'm that I'm wrong, that I don't know enough. And on the one hand, that drove a lot of curiosity in my earlier endeavors. Um, and as I've gotten older um, and I've gotten a million things wrong, like most people, but a lot of the framework thinking I've found has actually been been really solid, which therefore has been quite surprising to me, especially uh, public, obviously, is a much bigger company than than the previous ones. And so that's really a company where a lot of those frameworks have been stress tested, right? And I've always like defaulted to thinking, ah, this is a little bit too simple. And like, you know, let's hire, um, you know, let's figure out people who have uh, could do it better, et cetera, et cetera. And those certainly exist. We've hired a lot of those here at Public. But there are also many times when I'm actually thinking back now, a little bit more mature maybe and sort of, a little bit more, you know, calm, I suppose, than in my younger days and realizing, okay, that was actually not too far off the mark. And um, and so I think the one thing to then summarize it that I've learned, which then is the more cliche way of saying it potentially, but it's it's really to to kind of trust your instincts. And, you know, this and this goes for strategy as well as product, right? But um, I uh, saw this tweet the other day that you know one ounce of product intuition is worth a thousand AP tests or something like that, right? And I think really, you know, our industry, tech in general, have certainly moved into a place where a lot of things have become more quantitative um, and a little bit more all about the data and about the numbers and frankly a person that will geek out on data as much as as the next person but i think what sometimes can be a little bit overlooked in that development is also just like hey go with your intuition um because your intuition is something that is always evolving every every single decision you make whether you actively think about it or not actually helps shape your intuition right you are the product of all your previous experiences um and i think you know when you actively think about that, it gets you to a place where you maybe trust your instincts, your intuition um, a little bit more than um, than you otherwise would. Yeah. I mean, I love the way you've described that because it, it frames intuition almost as like this internal algorithm that we all have. It's being trained all the time. <laughs> it, you know, if we're, if we're kind of honest about it with everything that we're doing and, uh, but yeah, obviously you need that ability to be able to lean on it and be unafraid to do that and maybe unapologetic. And honestly, like right now, you know, as we sit here, everybody is very fascinated with the developments in, in AI and GPT and everything else. And those are super impressive and I'm super excited about it. But one, what we tend to forget is if we consider that to be impressive and, and that's, an, that's sort of a, an impressive mechanism, then consider the human brain, right? Uh, which is still infinitely more complex. And that goes back to like this internal algorithm, which is one way to describe your own intuition. And, and that's just something that, yeah, I feel like it's a little bit maybe overlooked. Uh, yeah, no, I love that frame. Well, one of my favorite things to ask guests about is favorite books. You know, some people have a lot of time to read or make a lot of time to read. Some people don't. And, you know, typically what I'm looking for is kind of either f books that have had an impact on you or books that you go to for tactics that you regularly kind of reflect back on for tactics strategy. So I'm curious what some of your favorite books are. They can be in any category. Don't have to be business books, can be fiction, whatever. Um, and what books or ideas from books you think have had the biggest impact on you? So you mentioned tactics. So my mind immediately jumps to two things. Um, the Messy Middle by um, our our friend Scott Belsky, which is awesome, highly, highly relatable. And and just all out all out fantastic. Even like the frameworks that he that he comes up with um, are some that I mean, 
he's an investor in public and and one, was one of our earliest users and have been incredibly helpful over the years in many different respects, both to me and life and some um, engagements he've had with our broader team as well. And he just has these like, he's coining these like great like frameworks again, which I think are, are really solid, but are yet quite simple, right? Uh, one is, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to swear on this podcast, but yeah, uh, please, DY, <laughs> DYFJ, do your fucking job, which I feel like, you know, he wrote that book, I guess in like 2016, like like in the straight in the middle of the bull market, the age of abundance, whatever kind of people call it. And like most great artists, maybe not quite appreciated as much in the, in, in the time that it's written relative to a few years out. Here we are, the markets have turned, everybody has to roll up the sleeves and do their fucking job. And like, I think that's something that just like um, those kind of concepts are just kind of, uh, kind of fascinating. And by the way, if you haven't read the Miss Middle, please do. Uh, the DYFJ concept is... Uh, much less arrogant than how I pr- probably portray it here. <laughs> so sorry, Scott, if I didn't do it justice. The second one I would argue, like in terms of impact, um, the hard thing about hard things, uh, obviously another classic, um, and so not not maybe a super novel choice, um, but I think that was maybe the most, one of the most raw sort of tales, again, in terms of like thinking about things to relate to you know the struggle poem right it's like at a you know that really um is borderline mental therapy for a lot of founders and uh and there was something about you know there was something taboo prior to that i feel about like admitting if you were struggling as a founder and so so after that all that came out it started to become a little bit much more frankly accepted to show your vulnerabilities and like embrace them frankly right um chris saga is another person that talked a lot about this stuff um and again those are concepts that i'm a big big fan of right i'm i'm super super i always over index in people on on self-awareness <laughs> more than anything else and this concept that like vulnerability equals strength right it takes it takes it takes a strong character to uh to see say things the way that they are and and to really open themselves up and and um and just you know not beat around the bush too much but also not risking too much what people might think of them in every given moment and that's a concept that i just like remember from from that book specifically and 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 you know the the sort of like the whole journey that ben was through i think it's just something that um a lot of people can relate to and it's not this tale of like building a hundred billion dollar company like you see in the tv the the tv shows tend to be about those kinds of companies and like the really 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 crazy stories which also makes them unrelatable at the end of the day you know hollywood adds another 30 percent on top and then you have something that's great entertainment but that you can learn as much from and so i i do really appreciate these like raw authentic kind of anecdotes um from folks that's been through very very successful outcomes but are also not afraid to uh to provide a a deep kind of vulnerable um yeah authentic glance into what the journey was actually all about yeah we actually had scott belsky on the show to talk about the messy middle so we'll link to that episode incredible incredible book and he's and he's amazing um you know and and you bringing up the kind of you know d what dyfj do your fucking job piece reminds me made me think of frank slootman's book amp it up which i think is another just you know incredibly direct clearly has a direct leadership style but i think the whole you know all of that book is kind of a wonderful meditation on what does it look like how do you create an organization to be able to do that um yeah fantastic books one one of the other things I love, you know, talking with guests about is their approach to productivity and performance. And this may seem a little, you know, well trodden, but really the way that I think about it, it's like if you have large enough goals, at some point you have to engage in the exercise <laughs> of ruthless prioritization of your time, your priorities, and just making sure that you're kind of geared up and can be on all the time. How do you think about allocating your time, prioritizing your work, and do you have any daily habits or practices around that? A lot of daily habits. Typically, actually, they evolve around the family more than me personally. <laughs> so, as they should. <laughs> so, obviously, that's a hard constraint um, that you're gonna work around. But actually, there's a lot of truth to that because, for me, I use habits as a way of, of you know, taking care of everything 
in my family and on the personal front so that I can flourish as much as possible in what I do with public. And I don't have any specific habits around public. Like obviously we've got a number of our processes and like good new meetings with different parts and this and the other, but, uh, but the public journey, as you know, has always just been very wild and, and frankly, no two months have looked the same. Um, and so, um, to the extent that I've tried to create any, any habits, they've probably quickly been broken because, you know, then we sort of been through COVID and then there was GameStop and other meme stocks and like this, it's always been something, right? And so I think I've used habits more as, um, as I've gotten older and, and realized that there's only 24 hours in the day and, you know, um, so trying, maybe failing, but certainly trying to take my sleep more seriously as well, you know, carving out enough of a time block and then what happens within that time block is sort of like less less habitual you could say to ask maybe a different question i mean one of the things you brought up there um that i think would be amazing to talk about is volatility you know you're just your experience at the company being all over the place so maybe to ask a different question how have you gotten comfortable with that and it you know how especially just when you have a family you have this this kind of high pressure job you need to go home and be able to disconnect i don't know any any uh thing that's worked for you or been helpful there at kind of end of day yeah so i think i've benefited tremendously from actually being in and around this industry since i was 17 years old so i kind of grew up with it and i sort of don't know a quote unquote job that didn't have that level, right? And like to to give the audience that I started my career in two thousand five, right? So like, you know, I think two years in already Bear Stearns, another yearly man, and then, you know, from there a bunch of other crazy stuff. So so I think I got well trained in compartmentalization very early on. But it's funny because in the early days you know, when you're 17, 18, early 20s, like you don't have anything. <laughs> like, you've got, like you've got friends and like you've got your family as in, you know, your parents and <laughs> so forth. But, you know, you're just much more kind of caught up in it. And as you start to have other very real responsibilities in the world outside of outside of your company, you got to compartmentalize a little bit more. But that's, and that's been the thing for me, compartmentalization. And I don't know if I've been a little bit of, um, a natural at it or I was just trained in it really, really early. It's probably the latter to tell you the truth. And so, you know, it, it just becomes ingrained and then you sort of like most other thing, it becomes a little bit like riding a, a bike to be honest. And I think that's, that's helped me a lot in the public journey as well. Like having been through all those kinds of experience, right. The, the dollar Swiss kind of pick that was removed back in 2015, which now reminds me of a lot of the stuff that you see in the cryptocurrency space and so forth. Right. And so it, I think it, um, you know, I, I, I certainly started my career, um, fairly early and probably a number of things that I missed out on as a result, but I do think that I reaped some benefits from that. And at this point by just having, having seen a number of things that can help me have a, a slightly different perspective on on all these events as they unfold. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like part of the key there is like acclimating to the environment so that you're used to it, so that your default isn't to be reactive and you can begin to be proactive and just be in the moment and try to lose some of that emotionality. A hundred percent. Totally. I'd love to ask two final questions. One that I always like to ask is around unique edges and superpowers. You know, you have this really fascinating background where you clearly have, you know, have a, a business mind. You've co-founded multiple companies. You also are, you know, very design minded and have spent a lot of time designing. How do you think about your edges or superpowers and how those show up day to day? Yeah, I mean, certainly having the sort of mind of the of a designer for better or worse, uh, or like for like a better wording. Um, it's just very impactful across the board, but definitely a huge net positive, right? And I think it doesn't just relate to to product design, right? Designing UI, UX, mapping out customer journeys and all that stuff. But I think the the sort of like design thinking concept stretches actually far into into strategy. I think there's a super interesting overlap with finance, right? Like I, I often do find myself at a little bit of a, an odd profile sometimes because it's sort of like a designer by heart, but just like grown and raised in finance from a very early age and, and, and 
I think the with that it it's really sometimes visualizing and this goes back to the intuition part maybe, but how changing a few pixels on a screen is gonna change numbers in an income statement. And there's a lot of stuff that has to happen in between. But I think because I've always been like, you know, sort of coming at it from both from both edges, um, that's that's really one thing that I think allows me to make decisions um very very quickly that i um have a a decent amount of confidence around um and you know a small enough error rate that if i can make those decisions quickly enough um ultimately we'll be pushing in the the right direction because you know um the the sort of success rate there i guess is is high enough that even if it's the wrong decision you can iterate on it super quickly etc but i think that like end to end view is something that i i try to also continue to nurture i try to stay super hands on i'm i think i am fairly hands on on all our product design decisions and 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 partly because i enjoy it quite frankly <laughs> i can't kind of help myself i think most of the designers of the public know that at this point but i also think it it helps to provide that like super high level kind of perspective because i think as an IC designer um, in a team, you're maybe looking a little bit more directly at just like the job to be done. You know, what's in the ticket? What's the user story? How do I immediately achieve that? And in a perfect world, you know, that rolls up to, you know, some sort of an OKR and that rolls into strategy, et cetera, et cetera. But like it's very few companies where all of that map 100% directly, perfectly up in this like beautiful tree. I think that's one of the things that, uh, maybe as a as a first time founder, you would think that you need to operate at that level to be successful, and I think it's not the case. Like no companies, frankly, that I know of, have that. And then in those instances, it is it is helpful to be the person who can then the a second set of eyes and and really see how moving signals around um has can have um, create a different financial outcome for the company. No, I love that. It's really taking those two sides of your brain or those two kind of perspectives, those two powers and, and putting those together and making sure that they connect. Final question is um, that I always like to ask is what advice you would give to your younger self if you could go back in time? You know, you talked about starting working super early. And so if you could go back to yourself, you know, in childhood, when you were in college, when you were in high school, at the beginning of your career, is there anything you would tell yourself that you could carry forward? You know, a reminder, words of advice, anything? I mean, uh, one thing, frankly, the first thing that's in mind, which I've sort of touched on, is actually like, like, trust and cultivate your intuition as much as possible. And the more you cultivate it, the more you trust it. Right? And I think there's a lot of self doubt in the journey, and some of that is just being very self aware of that stuff. And I think that is how you learn. That is how you improve upon yourself. That's how you pro- uh, make progress. But there's maybe also like I don't know, twenty, thirty, forty percent too much of it, which ends up being wasted mental energy um that could go into other things right and at the end of the day any company the most finite resource is not money it's actually potentially not even time it's mental energy at the end of the day right uh that that is the ultimate sort of most constrained kind of resource at the root level and so whatever you can do to actually optimize that and like really ensure that you spend that in the right places i think that's incredibly Paramount. It's also a very, very difficult thing to do, by the way. And that's where having um, frameworks have really helped me, both in terms of prioritizing uh, not just what to work on, but also what to think about. There's a lot of this stuff that just happens in thinking, right? Like I remember um, in my old company, I have a lot of travel days. I travel was sort of a fairly global platform. So a lot of going between Asia and Europe and the US. And um, you know, most of my teammates could probably test like whenever I would land after like a 12 hour plane ride or something, like there's something about also just being disconnected way up in the clouds. And, and you know, if you're really able to like do a lot of deep thinking there um, and again, so like carving out space for like allowing yourself to, to think deep and like really resonate through things and really reason through, you know, how things would potentially develop. I think is very important. Um, and then having some frameworks for how you prioritize, you know, which things require really deep thought. Because the other part of it is, is you got to work your ass off and hustle all the time, right? And so again, it's like, it's almost like 
sort of this uh, little bit of duality between just like you know checkers and chess, right? Like you gotta do both, <laughs> and 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 you gotta you gotta be in it and like constantly um, be pushing, pushing, pushing. But on the other hand, you also just can't push too far down a rabbit hole without stopping every now and again and like you know revisiting some of your fundamental assumptions. Are they still true and accurate? You know, are there hypotheses that you have validated uh, one way or the other um, to really guide, you know, the the direction in, in which you push, right? Your company is a ship and you got to spend time manning the wheel, but you also got to spend time looking at the compass and make sure it's not broken and it's pointing in the right direction. And how you balance those two is, is very, very difficult. But that's um, certainly as, as founder and CEO where I would over-index the majority of my time. So well said. Perfect note to end on. Thank you so much for joining me, Yannick. Awesome. It's great, Daniel. Thanks.